very important. I'm Katya for the invitation. It's great to be back in Moscow after exactly 30 years. I was here as undergraduate student on a kind of a student visit. And, uh, this was like the last time. And uh, of course, a lot has changed. But this morning, I had a spectacular kind of an experience when I exited my hotel, which is, which is near Tverskaya. I suddenly felt, you know, this surreal feeling that I'm, I'm in a movie because the whole Tverskaya has been full of tanks and the whole military was standing there and, you know, amounts of people with joy watching this performance was just incredible. So, um, actually, I saw the military is growing, uh, so I can attest that the, the you know, tanks actually look spectacular but um, also very scary. Now, I won't focus on the sort of military achievements. Rather, I will kind of go into the direction of looking at what are the movements in contemporary capitalism that we can observe and you know, how can, can we think through also the possibilities of change or if change or critique is possible, in which way it is showing today. Now, a lot of uh, writing in the domain of uh, business studies in the last years have been focusing on the problems of denial, ignorance, uh, willful blindness, and so on. Um, a lot of you probably are familiar with the books by the Harvard Business School professor Richard Tedlow, who um, you know, kind of looks at the kind of denial in big businesses and gives many examples of companies sort of who are kind of increasing their profits with a lot of you know denial linked to their practices. So one example that he gives is that at the time of 2010 disaster BP used all kinds of ways to deny consequences of ecological uh, disaster that was caused by deep water drilling. Now, Taylor gives three scenarios of why BP kind of for so long denied uh, that. You know, first idea of Taylor is that, okay, maybe it was sort of like quite possible that the company didn't know how bad things were. The second scenario, is, he says, it is possible that people lower in the hierarchy knew what happened but didn't want to tell the bosses. But the third scenario, he said it is possible that everyone from top to bottom knew what happened, but they, they just closed their eyes in front of horrible truth. So he says they saw, but they didn't see. They knew, but they didn't know. They were protectively stupid. You know, it was already in the past that this idea of kind of protective stupidity has been used, and it was actually George Orwell who pointed out that people often kind of use protective stupidities not to deal with uh, some inconvenient uh, type of truth. Now, Tedlo then kind of goes on into describing uh, denial as some kind of an illness of contemporary world, and his idea is that we have to fight daily against this illness. There have been also other writings in the domain of uh, business studies, uh, which are speaking about strategic forms of ignorance, where actually, you know, people kind of decide to ignore some things in order to be able to focus on others. But I will not kind of dwell on these uh, studies. I will rather sort of question what is the nature of ignorance and actually why ignorance shouldn't necessarily be taken as a kind of a per se negative concept. Now, of course, the paradox in today's society is that on the one hand, we are obsessed with visibility. The idea that everything is somehow visible or every, there is a surveillance sort of pretty much at every corner. Uh, also, the idea that we need to be kind of transparent with our emotions in regard to, you know, kind of how we are influencing each other to the point also of kind of searching for the truth inside, to see kind of the visibility inside of our bodies in a variety of ways, you know, we have been 
kind of turning into the search for the secret X in the body with the help of genetics, neuroscience, and of course in the domain of uh, business studies more and more we are kind of moving into all kinds of neuroeconomics things and so on. Again, trying to guess the insight of the subject, not only his or her psychological motivated motivations, but you know the brain itself as the machine where you know our consciousness and of course unconscious mechanisms are uh, in a way kind of grounded. Now in psychoanalysis, this question of sort of what is the insight of the subject, of course, has been placed in a very different way. And equally, the issues of ignorance, denial, negations have been perceived in a radically different way than in other fields. And again, not necessarily in kind of a negative way. When Sigmund Freud, for example, was speaking about negation and denial, he used an interesting sentence he, which one of his patients was uttered. The patient said at some point, the woman in my dream is not my mother. Now, no one said that the woman in this dream was the patient's mother. So for Freud, the question was, what was sort of the logic of this negation coming from directly from the patient? Freud's idea was that with this negation, the patient was naming something and of course at the same time telling us that this is not true. So Freud pointed out that what we have here is that a certain kind of repressed idea actually emerged into consciousness by the way of being denied. So negation becomes a way of making cognizant what is repressed. So for the moment, this negation opens up you know, something that has been repressed and of course the emergence of that thing, the shocking for example, thought about the mother, immediately is, is denied. So negation in a way is some way to which a traumatic element you know, which we can call truth of the subject suddenly becomes revealed. <coughs> but for Freud, negation is also a kind of a substitute, a substitute on a higher level for repression. Crucial thing is that denial as such is not a lie. It is rather a testimony of an uncompleted task of recovering content from the uh, repression. So, you know, a conscious lie would be an act which tries to deceive, but denial is sort of rather an act of impotence, we can say. Now, when we deny something, we actually, of course, also reveal what we want to hide, which is why the denial is kind of a revelation, which is also an opening up. So a paradoxical element in Freud's analysis is that he links denials, you know, negation, like, like the, in the sentence that I quoted, also as a moment out of which an emergence of something new can happen. Which is why in a paradoxical way Freud links negations like this to an element of freedom. So with a denial like this, a crack opens, into a certain kind of a, let's say, conscious discourse we have been uttering you know, to ourselves, a certain perception we were forming about ourselves and wanted to project outside. So a crack opens and something new can emerge. So, but what will emerge and what will be the consequences of that new is, of course, highly unpredictable. But for Freud, it's kind of the first measure of freedom when you know that suddenly the subject sort of gives up previous defenses. So sub, there is like a kind of, let's say, a crack, and you know what comes out, we, we will see later on. Now, in the domain of social, of course, we are endlessly dealing with all kinds of denials, negations, and of course, all kinds of forms of self-deception. We know very well from our own countries that politicians are usually masters of self-deceptions. 
George Orwell already warned us that politicians usually, you know, not only deny things, we know that very well, but you know, usually repeatedly use certain words to deceive. So already the anthropologist Bloch, you know, in an independent kind of thought about denial in, in more historical context, uh, uh, context and you know, ignorance too, pointed out that when we are repeating something again and again, that's all often, you know, in some way also kind of a way to deceive or a way to kind of uh, try to ignore uh, something traumatic. So when Orwell looked at the power of words which try to deceive, he pointed out that we have to be especially careful where, for example, politicians endlessly use the same type of words. And he said, we have to be careful when politicians use the words like democracy, freedom, patriotism, realistic, and justice. Now, it's been many decades since Orwell wrote this, but we can say that, you know, things are pretty much the same again. Now, the most used words by Hitler between 1933 and 1936 were freedom and peace. <laughs> I'm sure, you know, with the parade, this word will be repeated again in the context here. Now, communists, of course, in the past didn't use that many times the word freedom, and they used peace, but they, they loved to use the word equality. Now, in today's capital, these times, of course, we can say it's the opposite. We don't use that much the word equality, but of course, we continue endlessly using the word freedom. Now, Ibsen, however, reminded us that self-deception actually can be very useful for individuals, which is why in his play, The Wild Duck, he pointed out that when talking, when we take lies from an average man, we might very well take happiness away from him too. Of course, self-deception is also something that we endlessly suffer from as individuals, and especially we in the field of academia. In the late 90s, there have been a number of studies uh, done in the United States on self-deception in academia, which I think still pertain today. So in the US at that time, one research study, for example, they found out that 94% uh, of American university professors thought that they were better at their jobs than their colleagues. <laughs> I'm sure this probably continues to be the case. Um, and you know, there were kind of similar studies done also among um, students and high school seniors. Um, and they analyzed at some point a million of high school seniors, and they saw that you know, out of them, 25% of them thought that they are kind of the top 1%, and especially in, and they, that they were sort of absolutely they, more capable of getting along with others than their colleagues. Now, usually people tend to ignore things that might be traumatic and anxiety provoking. But Leonardo da Vinci nicely pointed out that the greatest deception that men suffer from is usually from their own opinion. And Upton Sinclair said that you know it is difficult to make to make a man understand something when his salary depends on not understanding it. <laughs> now, these are kind of let's say all ways of all kinds of deceptions, uh, uh, positive illusions, uh, you know, denials that we can observe in our daily life. And uh, why you know let's say even in kind of daily life self-deception might not be so negative. We only need to look at the domain of medicine. Now, uh, in medicine in the 90s, for example, there have been interesting studies on the power of self-deception. Unfortunately, those studies are kind of not going on anymore. But the past studies showed, that, for example, that people who experienced heart attack, um, they might survive longer if they deny what happened to them in contrast to people who, for example, change diet, uh, exercise constantly, um, are you know, vigilant in you know, improve their life. Now, 
with today's neuroscientific and so on studies, uh, genetics and so on, a lot of you know these studies point out okay maybe people who you know kind of suffered heart attack and then they really want to change their life, their uh, stress levels go so so high up because of this effort you know to change their life that that's the stress level then contributes to kind of a second heart attack. That's kind of let's say the, the new scientific studies about it. Now, psychoanalysts who work with, you know, severely ill people also saw that, you know, the worst thing that one can do is, is to take denial away from a, from a patient, you know, to kind of throw the information that the person doesn't want to deal with exactly, directly into a person's face. Now, there have been also very positive studies about denial in the kind of um, analysis of uh, marriage happiness. So it might be useful for you to know that you will be much more happy with your partner if you sort of deny the negative parts of uh, his or her personality. Uh, you know, so marital happiness, you know, show, uh, studies show that married couples who only see good and positive traits of their partners were much happier than those who saw the partners realistically. <laughs> Now denial, of course, have been you know operating in a way we regard economic crisis, we, and you know in the way we regard our sort of questions of development in society. But importantly, of course, it can be linked to the way we perceive ecological uh, changes, especially climate change. Here there is a wonderful episode about this theme from the famous Simpsons. <coughs> In one of the series of Simpsons, the little girl Lisa, the smart one, gets a homework in which she has to show how the town spring will be look in 50 years. Lisa decides to do a long research on climate change. Of course, you know, she becomes more and more depressed about, you know, what awaits their town. Their presenta her presentation in school is also terribly gloomy. She shows complete disasters, you know, pretty much an unrecognizable city in the future. Her teacher becomes concerned. She calls in the parents and tells that, you know, they need to send Lisa to a psychiatrist because she's becoming absolutely depressed. The, the psychiatrist discovered that Lisa is suffering from environmentally related despair. <laughs> She's prescribed a drug, a special medicine called Ignoritala. <laughs> now, when Lisa starts taking Ignoritala, she starts observing the world completely differently. She listens all the time to the song, What a Wonderful World. <laughs> she sees clouds smiling. She's in kind of a happy delusion. Now, parents in the end realize that it's much more horrible to deal with you know, this kind of deluded Happy Lisa, which is why at the end they take her off Ignoritala. Now, Ignoritala, of course, seems to be the drug of our time, especially drugs used by many big corporations. And you know, those of you who worked in corporate in the studies of corporations, of course, know very well the power of the greenwash, the kind of new advertising which, for example, especially British Petroleum, for example, has used in the last years. Uh, you maybe know that they, in some advertising, rename themselves into Beyond Petroleum. And they have also, you know, kind of uh, really embraced climate change in the way their offices are, you know, powered. So they have uh, many of their offices with, you know, kind of uh, solar panels on, on the roofs and so on, and they are using, you know, a lot of flowers in, in some of their advertising. Another company, E.ON, a big corporation which owns a lot of coal mines, also decided to do this green wash with solar power panels and, and so on. So basically, you know, that's, it's becoming kind of a part of the way corporations are functioning to kind of present a gloss of sort of a, you know, sustainable development behind of, whatever they're doing. Now today you might have noticed in the newspapers that a very big political change happened in Canada when in, where in Alberta a very 
you know, left uh, uh, um, leftist party just won the elections, and uh, the comment of the business people in regard to these elections has been that markets are very, very much afraid because what has happened is extremely dangerous. Of course, the markets are primarily related to the exploitations of bitumen and the new kind of a pipeline going from the uh, oil uh, sands into the United States, which will probably not happen as a result of the political, uh, political move. Now, I also quite liked uh, the studies in some Nordic countries about the power of uh, denial. Uh, here, uh, is in regard to climate change and the industry involvement in it, one of the most interesting studies that I came across have been by Karin Marin Norgat from Norway, who looked at the way Norwegians are, you know, capable of denying the problems of climate change. First, she looked at the way politicians sort of deny that they need to do pretty much anything to kind of speed it in regard to um, emissions. Uh, since we know that Norway's success relies on uh, oil, the politicians that she kind of analyzed had a very nice kind of a story, which was that uh, it is true that Norway, you know, is you know one of the big uh, kind of let's say uh, one of the countries which contributes quite a lot to emissions, but they claim that they are sacrificing themselves actually for humanity. The idea is that it is better, you know, kind of to pollute the, the, the environment a little bit by pumping uh, a lot of oil, than, you know, kind of pumping less oil and other countries will need to go back to coal mining, coal mining which might be more polluted. <coughs> That's the political idea of sort of a sacrifice for the global uh, humanity. But then she looked at denials of the ordinary uh, Norwegians, and there she found also very interesting individual stories, which was that you know majority of people she interviewed perceived themselves as lovers of nature, and um, you know they are recycling and so on. And you know when she asked them how come that you are not kind of more vocal about some you know global changes of your country in, in regard to. Uh, climate um, change, she saw with a lot of people anxiety related to the idea of progress. Since they knew very well that the progress of their country relies on the prosperity coming from oil, actually people sort of were afraid of any actual changes happening because this idea of prosperity might not go um, in the future. Now, quite often, Various other countries also show, you know, certain kind of climate change denial linked to a particular kind of a fear of a possible change that might might need to happen in regard to idea of development and you know especially the idea the idea of kind of a progress, which of course is still kind of a mantra ideology of today's uh, late capitalism. Now, when we are of course afraid of the future. We are often also, of course, afraid that the future will not involve the type of kind of progress that you know, sort of allowed us to live better than our predecessors. Now, what does psychoanalysis say about ignorance? Uh, Jacques Lacan has used, strangely, a term, passion for ignorance. His idea has been that people don't have passion for knowledge, but actually passion for ignorance. What did he mean with this? Lacan actually came to this idea of ignorance when in the 50s he was attending lectures on Buddhism. And since we know that in Buddhism, you know, in ignorance plays a very important role in one of the writers, which was at the time of uh, Lacan's uh, studies of Buddhism, quite present uh, in, in France, was Varpula Rapula. You know, his work was presented by various Buddhist French uh, scholars. One of the books uh, by uh, Rapula is What the Buddha Taught. And in this uh, work, you have a lot of writing 
about ignorance. Of course, the point of Buddhism often is that we need to kind of become, kind of, in some way, we need to deal with ignorance in such a way that we are not ignorant of ignorance itself. Here, you know, some versions of Zen Buddhism, for example, say that ignorance in itself is no evil, nor is it a source of evil, but when we are ignorant of ignorance, you know, that's kind of the problem in our life. Now, this Buddhist take on ignorance became important for psychoanalysis because it actually is opened up for psychoanalysis to see sort of the power of ignorance in a variety of ways as a very important element in the process of analysis itself. Now, First, we have a certain kind of a necessary ignorance on the side of the analyst. So the analyst shouldn't be the person, in a way, who actually, in a way, knows. Although the analyzant has, you know, this presupposition that the analyst is the subject supposed to know, the analyst should actually stay in a certain kind of a ignorance, which means that he or she needs to bounce back the question, uh, the question which often pertains to the question of desire, to the to, to the analyzant. The analyst should also not be the one who tells the subject what to do. So it should rather be a kind of an idiot, now and not you know a kind of a master or authority. Now, however, then another form of ignorance is found on the side of the subject which of course does everything not to come close to the question of his or her desire and especially not to come close to what in the Lacanian psychoanalysis we call the real or you know, we can also say that the subject does everything in a way to kind of ignore what is traumatic, anxiety provoking and what undermines his or her sort of a self perception. Now, Lacan also sort of pointed out in some way that you know ignorance you know is kind of something that is at the same time linked to the opening and closing of the unconscious. So here in a similar way you know he kind of touches problems like Freud with the idea of uh, negation that you know with the sort of ignorance we are kind of dealing with things that we have repressed problems of unconscious and you know we try to sort of with the, these mechanisms from repression to denial or and negation, misrecognition and so on somehow push traumatic things away from our consciousness. Now another important point of Lacan was that the subject's ego always has some kind of a paranoid structure. The human knowledge as such is paranoid in the way that, you know, quite often because we are captured, you know, in the kind of constant gaze of the others, because we are very much, you know, part of the social where we are guessing what does the other want, how, is, how does the other regard me, often we create, you know, as answers to these questions, sort of kind of a fantasies which might look a little bit Paranoid. We, through our guessing of what do others want, quite often we, you know, can create, you know, sort of paranoid uh, stories out of, out of it. Paranoid knowledge, however, is still some kind of a knowledge. It's a certain kind of a lucidity which is right on target in regard to all kinds of possible evils of or misfortunes that might come from the very fact that we are, we are embedded in a certain social space. However, quite often, you know, with this paranoid knowledge, we also try to kind of see a little bit too much of what is external, while we, of course, misrecognize very much the traumatic dimensions of that, what I might be for the other, or what I might be, you know, you know in the social symbolic space as such. Now, for Lacan, what is denied, however, is also in some way or another also known to the subject. So, in a way, the subject kind of through denial 
nonetheless is still dealing with the traumatic elements in him or her, and you know, to this kind of various forms of uh, ignorance, no matter in which way we kind of stick with them, we still deal with matters of life and death, which for Lacan and already for Freud are the most anxiety -related. Now, of course, quite often we think that for the subject, death is the most anxiety provoking. But for both Lacan and Freud, actually birth is equally anxiety provoking. Not just, you know, the act of, you know, being born, which, you know, for, for some other psychoanalysts have been, you know, the kind of the core uh, of the first anxiety, but the question relating to how was I desired? Why did they have me? You know, what was I in the kind of a fantasy of my parents and so on? Those questions again never find a proper answer and can be, you know, sort of equally anxiety provoking as the question of the end of the subject's life. Now, there are many studies of the power of denial in individual lives. And quite often, you know, people would deny, you know, in a variety of ways, things that might be threatening to their well-being. For example, studies in the domain of denials in medicine, denials related to life-threatening illnesses, would see that some people deny diagnosis, other people deny emotions linked to some diagnosis, still others deny the impact that illness might have on their, you know, on their life or on their family life, still others will sort of escape certain illnesses or knowledge about illnesses with kind of behavior changes, start excessively drinking, smoking, eating, or whatever. So we can see that, you know, there are no one ways in which people might deny uh, traumatic things in uh, their lives. Now, uh, in psychoanalysis, of course, ignorance is sort of element, the third element in the triad between love and hate. So, in some of the writings, Lacan places it as a kind of an element in the triangle, uh, and we can, in some way, that say that ignorance might actually also be sort of in between uh, love and hate. And paradoxically, in today's time, ignorance is very much promoted when it comes to these issues, both of love and hate. You know, in regard to love, there are all kinds of strategies where we are sort of thought how to enhance, you know, love or how to become an object we desire with sort of new forms of learned ignorance. If you have ever looked at kind of uh, women magazines like Cosmopolitan or self-help books, you will see how many books are about ignorance. Uh, don't respond immediately to the email of someone or the phone call. Uh, pretend that you are not interested in him or her. There is even a very a kind of a Bible in the past years. It was very successful in the United States uh, for men. Uh, the dating Bible, it's called The Game. Um, uh, I didn't read it, but people who read it told me that the idea is pretty much all about ignorance. So, for example, a man meets a woman in the bar um, and, you know, he really likes her, but the idea is that he has to sort of um, play the game very well by, for example, saying to her, um, you are a really interesting woman, but um, your haircut is really strange. And, uh, or, you know, something like this. And then, turn away, you know, so ignore her. Uh, and then the woman, you know, might actually sort of be so shocked by this comment that, you know, the idea is that in majority of cases the woman would come back to the guy and say, what did you mean with that comment that my haircut is not okay, you know, and that means that with his ignorance he had incited desire in her and then, you know, and kind of something might, might happen. If you look also at the forms of punishments that are advised to us as parents, especially in, in the Anglo-Saxon world, the, you have this uh, kind of idea of ignorance, uh, especially with small children, 
uh, time out. Now, I must say that as a mother, I completely failed with you know, following these advices when my son was little and I kind of tried time out uh, a little bit. You know, he started banging his head in the, uh, in the wall, you know. Uh, so, you know, instead of me punishing him, he started self-punishing. So I realized maybe this time out is really not universal or maybe it kind of works in the United States and not in Slovenia where no super ego is already, you know, so strong. But, you know, it's kind of the idea of ignorance in regard to hate, we are taught all kinds of forms of ignorance. You just ignore it, don't listen, you know, don't read the email, delete it before. Uh, you even read it of former lovers and, and, and so on. So we can say that today's capitalism, you know, on the one hand perceives ignorance as something, you know, traumatic, something we try to deal with, on the other hand, endlessly encourages us to be ignorant towards uh, each other. Now, let me move a little bit further with the sort of analysis of uh, how sort of ignorance is played out uh, in the social. Now, of course, we can say that in today's times where we are obsessed with the idea that everyone can make it, that it, everything is in my hands, if only I make you know, the right choices, we are kind of very much ignoring social mechanisms at work. We are pushing you know, the individual to endlessly feel you know, guilty and responsible for his or her success while we are completely ignoring the power of social choices and you know, we are actually sort of uh, quite, I would say, in denial about even possibilities of social changes. Now, these forms of ignorance and social inequality have been also quite analyzed in the last uh, uh, years. An interesting study a few years ago has been done by psychologists uh, in the United States, Dan Ariely and Michael Norton, who looked at how people perceive social inequality. They asked a large group of people how much do they think that the top 20% of the wealthy Ameri wealthiest Americans have in their hands in regard to all kind of public wealth. And the second question was, what would be a just distribution of wealth? Now, people thought in this survey that the top 20% might have about 60% of everything in their hands. And their idea was that a just percentage would be that they should have no more than 30%. Now, the reality is that the top 20% has more than 85% of everything all the wealth in their hands in the United States. After this survey, New York Times sort of uh, did a little kind of a, sort of a, a little survey of its own. They asked a number of commentators why people still perceive things in this way. So why people don't rebel against things if they actually think that in some way it's unjust that the top 20% have so much in their hands, how come that they do not act against this unjust distribution of wealth? Now, it was interesting to look at the type of responses they got to these questions. One response was that people in the United States are still driven by lotto mentality, which means that they still think that maybe in the future they will make it. <laughs> now, the other answer, I think, was a little bit more interesting, which was, okay, people maybe don't think that they will make it, but a lot of people think that maybe their children will make it. Let's say, maybe my son becomes new Bill Gates, and of course, you know, I don't want to tax, you know, his future earnings. That's why maybe, you know, I'm not so much against, you know, higher taxes on the rich. Now, the third answer was, that people are often more jealous about their neighbors and co-workers and not about the super rich who live so far away from them that their lifestyle is sort of unimaginable for the actual or ordinary people. The next answer was that you know people are passive because quite often they have been driven by feelings of guilt. 
the feeling of guilt that they have done something wrong, that they have overspent, that they have run big debt, and which is why you know they are kind of turning again into self-critic instead of social critic. And you know the next still answer was that you know some people might perceive that they are actually not doing so badly when they compare themselves to others, or especially if they maybe look at you know their, their previous generations. That's probably not happening more because young people are suffering more and more unemployment. And the last answer was that in times of crisis, there is not so much a desire to have as there is a desire to keep. And that might also be kind of a pacifying way. I think that there are many more answers to this dilemma of why people are so passive and are not rebelling against social inequality. Of course, one is the idea, you know, that still that this illusion of choice kind of operates as a very important part of ideology. The other, and the other important thing is also that we have, you know, kind of completely taken the idea of chance or randomness out of the way we regard, you know, the market. There have been, you know, in the past already obsession with computer programs, you know, kind of predicting, forecasting what will be the outcomes of the market. At the time of uh, the crisis in 2008, of course, the famous program VAR Value at Risk, which has been sort of computing the future uh, 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 gains, have been you know, quite criticized because it didn't, in its program, it didn't kind of account for the past economic crisis. It only looked at the data of the you know, prosperous years after World War II. However, this, in these years we seem to be back of this illusion of prediction, forecasting, and of course, behind this is the anxiety, when will the next crisis happen? But of course, linked to it is still a kind of a denial, ignorance, closing of our eyes. Now, we can also say that there have been various ideological mechanisms at work which are sort of pacifying us as individual. We know that consumerism has been you know, very much acting in such a way that it created a certain kind of an illusion of democratization, sometimes even democratization of luxury, in a way the idea being that everyone can, in one way or another, participate in you know, kind of the idea of what is the element of luxury, even if we get a fake good or if we get a little token of the big brands and so on, it appears we are kind of equal with others in this participation of you know, kind of the way consumerism is functioning. And um, of course we can also say that until recently, you know, still the ideology of choice very much relied on the idea that pretty much everything is up to the individual to predict, kind of forecast what might happen uh, with, uh, in, with people's uh, futures. And for me, what is interesting is to observe how psychoanalysts have you know, dealt with these anxieties. Uh, my friend uh, Susie Orbach, for example, interestingly pointed out that she meets more and more women who come to, uh, her, uh, uh, to her for analysis who have sort of made perfect choices in their lives, like, let's say, a rich woman or well-off young woman would come almost with a list of all the right choices that she had done in her life. You know, a good school, uh, maybe law, or economy, business, whatever. She found a job, uh, she's uh, good-looking, uh, she's exercising, she has maybe a partner, her own apartment. And then she, she looks together at all these choices and then she kind of makes a calculation and where is happiness? You know, sort of like, I've done everything right and like, why am I miserable? And of course, the type of choices she had done are pretty much the choices which have been propagated, you know, by the society as the right choices. Since I teach in law school, I often, you know, law lawyers are the most miserable people. <laughs> Law students equally, you know, <coughs> depression, alcoholism, drugs, self-punishing, bulimia, anorexia, suicide, you name it. 
So, you know, why, so I ask my students, why would you come to study law if it's such a miserable study and future profession is completely miserable? Even if you earn massive amounts of money. Now, my students, you know, usually would say, oh, you know, my grandfather was a victim of some crime or a holocaust or something, and I want to put things in the right way, I will fight for justice. This was like in the past. Now, you know, now they say, oh, I have been watching Law and Order, and I like this lifestyle, what I saw, and now I'm really depressed because of the economic crisis, and I won't come you know, to have this uh, lifestyle. So you can see that their answers have been linked very much to what is perceived as the right choice in society. They don't deal even with the dilemmas of kind of their own uh, desire or you know, kind of the more complicated motivations behind. Now, uh, in conclusion, let me kind of point out to what kind of criticism might emerge. What are the options? to see things a little bit in a different way. Since we are a conference on emergence, let us look also what kind of you know, forms of uh, criticism of capitalism of today have emerged in the last years, and what have been the reactions of this emergence. Now, uh, three years ago, I was invited to Kyo um, to, to the first and probably last, I don't know whether they had another one, Kiev Biennial. And a, a, an adjacent exhibition to it was organized by Russian artist Oleg Kulik, who used to be the dog in the past, I don't know what it is now. Um, and Kulik, in this chocolate factory, created a really interesting exhibition called Apocalypse and Rebirth. And this was an art, a little art piece. It was kind of a little piece on a table of these figures with the protest signs. The artists were uh, Luizin Janyan and Alexei uh, Knedlyakovsky. And the idea was that they were kind of dealing with the um, elections at that time um, in Russia. Now, uh, at the opening night, one of the high Kiev politicians um, secretly, with his hand, went into this, uh, in the, into this piece and took away the protest signs, some of the protest signs, and put them into his pocket. He was afraid, because Putin was coming to visit in the next weeks or something, that there would be, you know, kind of less love coming from the neighboring country. Now, when this happened, of course, there was quite a shock in the artist community. They wanted these things back, you know, the Oleg Kulit and so on, they were angry. But, you know, in a few days, they decided to close the exhibition because of pornography. Because this one piece on the, in the garden was called the natural phenomenon, Alexei <laughs> Kuzinka, and that, that was the piece which presumably kind of provoked outrage of the authorities. Yes, of course, this was sort of a kind of a, let's say, a cover for the other piece which actually bothered the, uh, the politicians uh, much more. Now, uh, you probably also know that the woman who was the director of Bayania later, in the, actually not long ago, became famous that before one of the exhibitions uh, uh, in Kiev, I think it was maybe uh, two years ago or so, that she, before the opening night in the arsenal, uh, there was like a kind of a mural criticizing Ukrainian politicians in some mocking way, and um, uh, Natalia, I think it's a blood or something is her name, uh, she went uh, before the opening and took kind of a, a lot of black paint and threw the black paint on, the, on that mural uh, in a secret way, director of, of this art space. So the next day the artist was completely shocked to see his work ruined. Now, Natalia kind of later said to the media that she had a kind of a crisis, a moment of crisis. She didn't know what happened to her, but of course she was again afraid that politicians might see that image and will not like what it did. 
Now, in the last years, we have seen kind of the emergence of outrage against capitalism in the, in the most kind of, let's say, surprising uh, spheres on top of art. Of course, we have seen it in, in the fashion, although you know, we are constantly bombarded in fashion that everything is in our hands. We need to dress for success. You know, many fashion houses have decided now to kind of act against, you know, the crisis in, uh, the, you know, so this is like a climate change uh, fashion uh, uh, catwalk by Vivian Westwood, Chanel also did the protest uh, as part of, you know, their, their show. But the best example of kind of fashion playing now kind of a strange emergence of the new point of criticism have been, you know, uh, of course, you know, our big politicians who have been, you know, dealing either with showing the body like your president here, and you also have a solution for this by Merkel, but even more, you know, <laughs> in, the, in the just last couple of months, you know, the kind of the emergence of critique of, you know, where capitalism with its austerity obsession is going have been, you know, Yanis Varoufakis, who with his choice of dress have created an absolute crisis in Europe. So he started, you know, touring around Europe, you know, pretty much trying to get Greece out of, uh, you know, the, the total austerity uh, crisis. All media in Europe were writing about his dress codes. So there was a long article in uh, Guardian when he, when he met with Osborne saying it was a bit of a fashion moment, you know, this meeting. They said there was Osborne riding himself high in his rebooted fashion skills, on his rebooted fashion skills with Julius Caesar haircut and properly fitting suit, shaking hands with a man wearing a Weatherspoon's appropriate bright blue shirt <laughs> and an early 1990s Manchester drug dealer's coat. <laughs> <laughs> now, there have also been a very long article in Australian newspapers saying that Varoufakis, you know, drives motorbike, has a backpack on his shoulder, never wears a tie, never tucks his shirt in, you know, often has his suit color up, he keeps one hand in a pocket when greeting foreign dignitaries, and he has one of the most commented on coats ever worn by a politician. And, of course, you know, we, you know, we have, you know, the ideas like this. But then, you know, when Tsipras visited Renzi uh, in Italy, Renzi gave him a tie. The idea was that if in the future Tsipras, uh, when they, if they get out of austerity, of course he will need a tie. And you know they want that they would have, that he would have an Italian tie. But Italian newspapers said that the style of Athens speaks volumes about Greece's desire not to respect any conventions. And of course, in some way, the hint was not to pay off debt. Now there have been you know kind of numerous politicians who have decided to dress in various you know interesting colors. But when the Speaker of Greek Parliament wore this coat, again, every newspaper was reporting how inappropriate it was to show up in such an unfashionable outfit. You know, and you know, we can see that this obsession with you know, the question of whether you know, Greeks have tie or not have been, in a way, kind of linked to the desire of them to kind of to provoke, to oppose with that little thing that they can do. You know, no one really wanted to debate kind of the social, economical problems. So the debate of Thai, in a way, must, I think, some important things. Now, first thing is, how do politicians pretty much today look like? It looks that everyone looks like kind of bankers from Wall Street. Now, it is not that they look like bankers, they are bankers from, <laughs> from Wall Street. So when you have, you know, Varoufakis and Tsipras, in a way, opposing, uh, uh, that type, it might very well be that, you know, they have been kind of, at least symbolically, you know, try to sort of make a mark. Now, this has been an image used at the time of the Occupy Wall Street. We 
which we, we, we can see, you know, pretty much is still kind of something we should kind of go back to. Although, you know, we have a kind of a whole anti, you know, Thai movement, of course, emerging from the Silicon Valley, where, you know, after Steve Jobs and others, you know, type of fashion, you would never get a job if you actually show up at the interview with a tie. That's the advice that you get, you know, from that dress for success kind of internet sites. Now, of course, ties can be equally problematic when you think about germs. Now, ties are usually full of bacteria, <laughs> which is why British doctors are not allowed to wear ties when on duty. So we can say that maybe Tsipras uh, and Varoufakis actually stopped wearing ties because symbolically they don't want to be infected by the bacteria of neoliberalism and are also trying in a way uh, to avoid being pulled by their ties in the circus of posterity. We know that pulling someone by the ties is one of the kind of quite uh, known way of little tortures that at least boys are doing to each other, you know, in kind of British private schools. <laughs> now, let me conclude. Uh, of course, there have been very interesting ties you can buy now, you know, like the Freud and Stephen. I like this one. I love my impression. <laughs> Uh, now, uh, we can say that, you know, this obsession that with the proper dress you will find success is part of this ideology of sort of making, self-making that operates today. And when I looked at, you know, the dress for success, all kinds of advice you can get, you have delusional ideas behind that, let's say, if you are working at home, you should also dress for success. So some advice that you get is that you should dress at home in front of your computer in exactly the same way as you would dress to meet your business partners. Because, you know, following the famous law of attraction, you know, which has been immortalized in the biggest bestseller in Self-Help, The Secret, that you will attract money towards yourself with your proper suit. So even if you are on the phone, you should be dressed as if you are meeting the person. Because on the phone, the person like, can guess you whether you are up for success or not. You know, if you speak, you should speak with confidence as if you know you are kind of in an actual business interaction. Even if you are typing the email, and you should be dressed in the same way to attract proper things. Now, in the last few months, in the fashion domain, there have been a lot of debate that fashion system have been completely obsolete. The famous trend forecaster, Lee Edercourt, recently shocked the fashion world with a statement in a manifesto that we have come to the end of fashion. She said, the system of fashion is completely obsolete. Fashion schools, colleges still teach students to become big divas, big designers. They believe that there is a life of fame waiting to them, while they have no idea anymore how to even deal with materials. And of course, she points out there is a whole kind of a hidden underworld of exploitation on which, of course, fashion very much relies. There are corruptions in the media, there are bloggers who are paid by, by the companies to you know, advertise uh, objects and so on. And you know, in some way, all these have kind of killed the whole sort of fashion. The, the idea of greed, not vision, is what she says is kind of dominating the fashion world. There is no more fashion with big F, she points out. It became ridiculous. We have shows which are 20, 12 minutes long. We drive to them, 45 minutes, everybody is waiting for a short fashion show, but nobody watches them anymore. Editors are on their phone, nobody is carried away. So that's kind of a the disillusionment of one of the big forecasters of future trends. Now, first, the solution is that we should go back to clothes. I'm surprised that she points out we should actually try to embrace kind of clothes and, you know, go back to maybe sewing or couture and so on. Because clothes have also become obsolete. Pretty much, you know, our, our rooms look like now this. 
And I was, you know, shocked when I saw this abundance of, you know, things that we are kind of drawing it, drowning it in our everyday lives. Also, in a kind of, you know, realistic way presented in, in the artwork. Now, this is the artwork which a few years ago have been in Paris exhibited in Grand Palais. Uh, uh, it, it, it was uh, the work of Boltanski. Now, uh, who piled clothes, but then, sorry, then I was shocked when I visited last year Belgrade and I saw this image in the newspaper. And this was the collection of clothes for poor victims of the floodings. So the, there was absolutely almost no difference between this image and, you know, this image, slightly better pile of clothes, but sort of like you can see that clothes themselves can become almost like an object, object you know, horrifying, disgusting, when you see it pile up and so on. So what's the solution? The solution is Pavlok. Pavlok is a new device, a wearable device. The device which allows you to become super productive. You, you program into Pavlok how much you want to work, how many hours you want to run, what you want to eat, drink, you know, how you won't waste time on internet, and so on, and then, what they say, you wear your willpower, because if you don't fulfill your plan, Pavlok electrocutes you. <laughs> so, Pavlok is the new super ego, which the subject is now able to buy for $250, and you wear it on your wrist. So, in times where we are not relying on outer authorities, we actually can buy a super ego to punish us at our will. Now, let me conclude with a certain embracement, I would say, of ignorance. Not only that one should sort of kind of not be too critical of ignorance as such, when it comes to our dealing with traumas, one should also allow ourselves to be left alone, to be a little bit ignored, to sort of kind of, uh, you know, escape the all visibility of eye, the eyes and sort of kind of all kinds of mechanisms of social control that dominate in our society. I very much propose you to see a film uh, entitled, you know, Happy People, The Year in Taiga. It is done, it's a documentary film by Bernard Herzog and Dmitry Vaskuyova. It's done in a Siberian village, far from civilization, where most of the time you have snow and cold. You have white Yenisei River, frozen most of the time of the year. People are living there, you know, fishing, doing all kinds of simple things in this wildlife. But every four years, they are visited by a politician. Now, before elections, when you know the Yenisei River is not frozen, usually a politician comes, and we can see in this film that you know politician comes usually with some presents. They bring some flowers, they bring music on the boat, some sexy young girls, they are dancing, they give a speech. Now the interesting thing is that nobody listens to these politicians. Children are playing. Adults are looking, you know, who is this? They completely ignore the politician. And I sort of kind of like that kind of, uh, you know, ignorance, you know. The very fact that politicians so much ignore, you know, the questions of actual social change, the well-being, can be, I think, only sometimes countered also by, you know, the power of ignorance that people can show towards them. Thank you. Thank you very much for the speech. Um, I was I want to ask a question about how you see the difference between ignorance and then how you could demarcate that from on the one hand false consciousness and then on the other hand deception. Because there seems to be a difference between ignorance and deception as in the false consciousness. So if you take your first example uh, with British Petroleum, yes. you could like one of the so like one of the explanations there was uh, the executives of BP are subjected to false consciousness. Basically, they don't know what they're doing, right? And then you could also 
on one of the other explanations is that they are deceiving us, right? They very well know what they are doing, but they are consciously, you know, uh, creating this greenwashing scheme to like deceive us, right? Yes. But ignorance seems to be like a third category, in, or at least that's sort of my impression from yes, hearing this. Yes, yes, yes. And I wonder how you could perhaps elaborate on how you see the difference then between ignorance and false consciousness and deception. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you that in, in this case, I think you can see all these categories at work, especially in, in the BP. You know, I think that you know the, the self-deception, and you know, with, with some people also you know conscious deception uh, of others. But you know, I think that the power of ignorance here is actually they really sort of ignored. Uh, you know, they kind of wanted to ignore uh, what might be the outcome. I think that that's, that's what's where, where I would see ignorance here, you know. There is this kind of a, let's say, um, not thinking at all beyond their self-interest, where I would see that their ignorance in this case. In this case, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that this is a universal definition of ignorance, but in this case, I would say ignorance about the well-being of, of other, ignorance about the consequence on nature, you know, like kind of, you know, also in some way willful blindness about that. So in the DP thing, probably the last theory, uh, 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 you know, which I presented, probably called it everyone knew. Everyone knew, but you can, you know, you, you see, but you, that kink is naked, you know, but you actually don't have it. And I have seen that in other corporations. Uh, I had privilege once to speak with a person very high up in in a pharmaceutical and I asked that director, I said, how do you deal with the fact, you know, when let's say there is doubt about one of your drugs, when maybe some of your researchers already noticed, you know, there are side effects with one of your drugs. What happens in this corporation? He would say, you know what, that person probably will not utter uh, that doubt because if the drug is selling well, you know, there will be probably bad consequences for his position. No one really wants to hear doubt in a situation like this. So a person will be, in a way, kind of silent, although he or she kind of notice something that might be, you know, very damaging for others. So we are kind of here, ignorance again in regard to consequences and, you know, willfully lying. Yeah, I have exactly the same question. So I'd like to ask everybody to ignore that he asked the question, and I have a better pop culture reference if you'll allow me. But as a thank you for an extremely lively and memorable keynote uh, lecture for us. Um, so if you'll allow me the pop culture reference, you yeah. tickled me to, to present to you with the Simpsons reference, and it works as a nice parallel. In an episode of South Park called You're Getting Old, Stan, one of the young children, starts to see absolutely everything in the world as shit. Yeah. Everything becomes shit. He goes to an Adam Sandler movie, and instead of seeing the actor on screen, he sees, he sees a well-formed turd. And everything that the actor says sounds to him like flatulence, and he complains to his friends, this is all shit. Yeah. Stan goes to a psychiatrist, similar to Lisa, yeah. and he's diagnosed with the condition of being a cynical asshole. <laughs> And also, he's put on some drugs and he gets better. Uh -huh. So my question is this, which is very supposed to this question. Ignorance, as you understand this, in your reading of psychoanalysis and Canon Freud, is it, is it a mechanism, a psychic mechanism? It's already a constituent part of the makeup of the subject? Is there a mechanism that's already there? Or is it a psychic capacity? that is mutable, workable, that we can work with and work upon. And depending on your answer to that, how can we avoid being cynical assholes? Okay, thank you for the, uh, for the example and the question. Yeah, yeah. In, in Lacan's theory, sort of ignorance is definitely different than, for example, misrecognition. So, you know, his idea is that for misrecognition, there has to be already some recognition. Uh, 
link to it. So there is some connection related to knowledge which we then actually don't want to see, you know. And with ignorance for him is that actually we actually don't want to come close to any knowledge. That's why he says it's kind of passion for, for ignorance uh, and not passion for knowledge. You know, so ignorance is linked here to the real. So to the fact that, you know, the emergence of the uncivilizable, traumatic, real would undermine the subject and uh, self-perception fantasy or whatever, which is why the subject does everything not to come close to it. You know, so truth, uh, knowledge, that would be what you know disrupts the subject self-perception, and that's what the subject tries to kind of avoid with ignorance. So that's you know ignorance is sort of uh, the way not to come close to knowledge. Exactly, that's that's kind of the psychoanalytic um, ABC, and as such, you know, in ignorance would be a very useful kind of mechanisms of the subject, but you know, a, a mechanism which can easily kind of get undermined when there is a, this eruption, the opening, you know, where, you know, kind of the real or the conscious erupts through, which you know, sort of be the first example from Freud, you know, can also be perceived as an opening for something new, you know, like not necessarily uh, a predictable thing, but you know, it might be that the subject actually moves forward, that there might be a change in the symptom, there might be maybe alleviation of suffering or not. You don't know, you know, what, what will be with this, when the mechanism sort of, of, uh, of ignorance kind of stops working uh, rather effectively. Can we avoid to be the cynical assholes? I guess not, you know, I guess not. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you for that uh, wonderful talk. Um, this is not so much a question as a little bit of a confused uh, um, expression of my own you know, thoughts. Um, we spoke about neoliberalism and capitalism and ignorance in that context. Yes. And uh, my question, my thought really is that as we criticize the BPs of the world, yeah. the Goldman Sachs of the world, the fact is the BPs and the Goldman Sachs of the world are doing what they're doing because society is collectively permissive in the sense that they want to be ignorant. Um, in a way, society needs the energy. It needs the power to, to run, run economies and societies and states. Um, are these corporations then misplaced targets of our cynicism? Um, is, is, is ignorance really, you know, is the attack on ignorance really uh, to be shifted to a to very different, uh, if you will, orbit? Um, to, to, to the order of the extreme instrumentality of our existence, to the here and now, you know, of what we want and how we want it. At the end of the day, parents in India still want their kids to graduate and work for the BTs and the Goldman Sachs of the world. It doesn't matter that these companies, you know, are doing things which are, which are clearly not right. But, you know, so people in America still want to get a second home, right? They, they were willing to take mortgages from, from, big, from big banks because they wanted to fund their first home and then their second home, etc. And they would still want to do it. So is the target of ignorance really elsewhere um, as opposed to the representation, so the more obvious ones like the, the corporations of the world? Uh, so that's really a confused thought. It's not so much a question. Yeah, you opened, you know, very important uh, questions, uh, which, oh, yeah, you know, the question of actually the power of corporations uh, in today's world, um, and we know that uh, they seem to control politics more and more, and not politics or the states them, and. Uh, just recently, for example, in the United States, there have been a really quite an interesting debate uh, about corporations that, uh, you know, not all that in 2004 they became subjects, um, but in 2014 they got a soul uh, because corporations now, for example, can claim that they have been um, uh, racially attacked or that their religion. Uh, have not been respected and so on, so they kind of 
have a soul. And, but the, there was an interesting text I remember in New York Times about this, that which said, okay, corporations might be subjects and they have soul, but you know, actually they are still not like people because uh, 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 we can't uh, execute them. You know, there is no death penalty uh, in regards to them. <laughs> I think that through this kind of cynical remark, there is actually you know quite a lot of truth. I uh, I would say that I understand you know what you said that people want prosperity through you know working for for the big corporations and so on. But here I remember a very interesting uh, column by uh, by uh, 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 you know what's the Nobel Prize uh, economist uh, from the Times from New York Times Krugman. <laughs> Krugman said somewhere, you know, that in his youth, um, the most boring economists went into banking, and you know, his conclusion was that he would like to make banking boring again. And I think that, you know, in some way, that points out that sort of the, the excess of the finance world, the enjoyments linked to it, you know, the, also the excess in payment, the, the risk taking, and, and, and so on. You know, it's, it's something that have created these desires to work in, in Goldman Sachs and so on. And if we kind of go back to the regulations to make banking and finance work boring again, I think a slight shift probably will happen also in regards to the desires that, that you mentioned. But I'm sure that a lot of people here have been working much more in the criticism of, of corporations and they probably can add something to this. Very interesting uh, question. Yeah, uh, I would like to go back to your point on this ignorance of uh, inequality or sort of the exact ratio of inequality. And I kind of recognize from my own field, which is exactly the creation of money and banking. And one of the, for me, sort of big discoveries was that, in fact, our money supply is created by banks and not as by states. And my experience is that there's a, there seems to be a, like a similar refusal among people to take this in, even if it's a simple point, they just take it in. And then you 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 uh, propose a number of explanations for this refusal, and one of them you said was guilt. And I'm thinking that there's also an element of shame, because I'm, I'm thinking so we, we all know yes the banks screw us. However. Realizing that they actually just make the money is, I mean, I mean it, it's almost shameful to recognize. That. So we've been fucked over so much. Is that really? So I think that's part of the, the also a, a, a part of the. So my question to you is, mm, is there a psychoanalytic solution to this? How? Because how, I think you, you said you can't just present it. Then we, we cannot get around this refusal. But how how to go about it uh, otherwise? Yeah, in in in, uh, in my uh, work on choice, you know, my kind of main main idea was that you know this shame, guilt, feeling of inadequacy, anxiety that you haven't done the right choices, the kind of delusion that everything is in your hand, the belief in rational choices. All this, you know, kind of created a perfect way to subject the individual to the type of capitalism that we live, you know, actually prevent criticism or social change or engagement and, and so on because you are constantly working on yourself. And uh, the feeling that you have done something wrong or that you should be ashamed for your choices uh, and the feeling of guilt, I think that's the most important in the subjective. And also anxiety, you know, anxiety is everywhere, you know, in the workplace, the idea, you know, also that you are competing for these little things with your colleagues, the idea that the winner takes all, you know, all those things. But now I'm thinking more and more, what's also a very important element is various forms of cruelty. You know, so on the one hand, in, in, the, man, in the management, like, uh, uh, manuals, 
from 70s on, I have observed, I looked a little bit at, at them uh, uh, in the past to see, you know, the discourse, just to see what's the discourse of the advice that you get, how to become, you know, a successful manager. And cruelty, the discourse of cruelty increased from the 70s on, at the, at the time of oil crisis, the idea was, you know, that you have survivor of the fittest, you know, and you have to kill the competition. Uh, and only winner takes all. That ideology also started. And it kind of escalated in the last years. If you look also the television shows, almost every reality film uh, television show is about cruelty. Uh, even the, like the chef, who is the fame, who will become the chef, or like who will become a supermodel, to put someone down. You know, and to, to kind of verbally even, you know, attack them. Uh, I don't watch television much, but when I see these shows and, and the cruelty being so much part of it, you know, and then, you know, having a device like Pablo, which kind of introduces self-cruelty, I start thinking that Lacan really was onto something when he pointed that out that capitalism becomes a system when people start developing the illusion that they are a master, although they are still a proletarian slave, and then they start not only working more and more, but they also start, in a way, self-consuming. You know, creating all kinds of symptoms where we are we're kind of eating ourselves from bulimia, anorexia, addictions, workaholism, you know, and so on, and, you know, various forms of self-punishment. And now, with this obsession with tracking, you know, people are tracking every moment of their, how many steps are doing, you know, the iPhone is telling you or, or whatever, you know. And I think that's kind of a really creating a new form of cruelty where, you know, in, when we don't have traditional authorities, we are endlessly prohibiting ourselves things. So monitoring ourselves, tracking ourselves, you know, or of course, linked to the illusion of progress, success, you know, happiness, which is the biggest, I think, danger that we encounter, the happiness studies, you know. I have visited a few years ago Bhutan, which is supposed to be the first country which introduced this gross national product measured in happiness. And, you know, when you are as a tourist, you, you often don't understand how the country is really functioning. So I started asking local people who are dressed in national costumes, who are kind of smiling when you come you know, as a tourist, you know, why are you dressed in national costumes? Oh, it's obligatory. <laughs> How come? You know, if we don't dress in national costume, we are put in jail, okay? <laughs> um, what about happiness uh, project? Oh, um, yeah, is it for everyone? No, 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 not, not, for, not for Nepalese. How come? Oh, if you are Nepalese, if you are not a Bhutanese, you can't really participate, you know, you don't get free education, uh, health care, whatever, you know, and if a Bhutanese marries a Nepalese, he also loses all his happiness benefits. So it's like, you can see, you know, again, cruelty usually to the neighbor behind ideologies, you know, that, you know, then kind of penetrated the, the discourse um, in other developed countries very much in the last year. So everyone is now studying the index of happiness pretty much, you know. I would kind of prefer that we stick with misery, you know. <laughs> there would be no creation without misery if, we, if we are super happy, which <laughs> just we really don't want to do anything and become quite unhappy soon. So I'm going to take the last question and then I'm going to refer to a, a, a journal uh, that was talking about the experience of using the, the electrifying process. So there was a journalist who like, kind of uh, wrote down their experience with it. And after, I think, one week of, uh, of its use, she started like being lazy and then electrifying herself as a banishment. But taking the pleasure of the punishment instead of actually changing her life. Like, so she had like a double harm kind of effect in the end. The symptom prevailed. She would have like a whole chocolate and then electrify herself like. <laughs> 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 like this is going to be great. Oh, wow. That's after only like one or two weeks, it degenerated extremely to this kind of other side of 
come with productivity. So, I mean, um, what, what they find like, a, like exciting in, in this example is that the realization of, of ignorance is not enough sometimes. Like, the, you can realize that the, the ignorance, like, occupy the cynical position and then still be kind of electrifying yourself in the end. And instead, I was thinking maybe well, what would be like an, an ethics that goes beyond this kind of, you know, self electrifying What would be like the possibility of actually, instead of just kind of accepting like ignorance, kind of, I don't know, foreclosing in the function and just go beyond that. Okay? Um, would it be psychotic? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I thank you for, for this uh, example. You know, which probably you know will kind of. Uh, open the doors for new forms of masochism uh, on a universal, on a universal uh, scale. Um, I don't think that that can be, you know, a clear answer to your second uh, question. I think that it's so highly individual how you know we deal with our, you know, traumas uh, with sort of uh, the knowledge. Uh, uh, how you know every individual sort of kind of uses the ignorance. So I, I don't think that that can be in kind of an universal way out. And actually, if I wanted to make one sort of statement, it was actually not to have a negative view about ignorance per se. You know, so on the social level, yes, you know, making the criticism of what we discussed about BP or other corporations, denials, you know, deceptions, and so on. On the individual level, you know, sort of embrace ignorance as an important part of uh, subjectivity, an important part also, you know, especially when we are dealing with various anxieties about the end of life uh, and, and so on. And actually, you know, carve the space of, um, not be endlessly seen, you know, and that is also kind of a respect. I would, yeah, so an ethical conclusion would be a respect, you know. When we respect another, we avert the gates. We don't want to probe too much, uh, you know. We even pretend that the king is maybe not naked, you know. So I think a return to respect allows us, you know, a certain kind of a, a Ignorance uh, in a positive way uh, towards each other, and kind of yeah, you know, on the social level, you know, to sort of find more spaces uh, where you are not endlessly visible. But now nowadays we can say we ignore the very fact that we are endlessly controlled and uh, visible. And uh, in the last lecture, my sort of thought was um, I was uh, recently in, in Turkey. And um, people there were telling me that when people now meet and have some important things to say, maybe businessmen or, or whatever, they all take their mobile phones out and take their battery out. You know, so a, a gesture of respect towards each other is that everyone takes a battery out. The idea is that first they are afraid that you know someone control uh, is monitoring them through the mobile mobile phone and also that another person might record the conversation. You know, so in some way kind of a you know, that's a new form of sort of ignorance at least, you know, or, or carving the space to be at least temporarily ignored. Thank you very much.